Okay. Quickly, Damien Roussan, Sorcery Institute, tax-exempt 501c3 nonprofit <laughs> network of independent professionals working on applying modern software development practices to scientific computing projects, uh, primarily in modern Fortran and also mixed uh, Fortran C, C++. And uh, last year, I gave you an overview of some of the features that were coming in what we were then calling Fortran 2015. Uh, the, the Fortran Standards Committee has had kind of an odd practice of naming each version of the language based on when the feature set became clear, even though it might often then take several years to actually integrate those features into the standard and publish the standard. So we finally decided to adopt a practice that I think is more common uh, with languages. And so we're, what I was calling Fortran 2015, we're now calling Fortran 2018 because it will actually be published this year. And uh, one piece of good news is that some of the things I showed you last year were sort of uh, previews of what was coming, whereas now everything I'm going to show you is in the standard and, or almost everything, I will show you one language extension, but it's a very minor one. And also everything I'm going to show you has at least partial support in uh, the GCC Fortran compiler um, with some of the things uh, being in the most recent release, GCC 7.3 and uh, one feature set that will be coming in GCC 8, which will be released probably this spring, um, but is already available since GCC is open source. If you build it from source, then you have access to everything that I'm showing you today. So I'll talk about some experiences with application development in uh, Fortran 2018. And what I'll talk about comes out of uh, two papers that, these were extended abstracts, actually four page uh, abstracts that were published uh, and uh, in the proceedings of a workshop at SC18 uh, in November. And the workshop was the PGAS Applications Workshop. I imagine in this audience most people are familiar with the concept of PGAS, uh, Partition Global Address Space. And uh, you may or may not know, unless possibly you came to my talk last year, that Fortran is now a PGAS language. And uh, in fact, I oftentimes make the point that we don't necessarily have to use the term Cori Fortran, which even though I do use it somewhere in this talk, we could just say Fortran, uh, because the Colerate Fortran features are now part of the standard and supported by um, at least three compilers, Intel, Cray, and GNU, uh, with some support from the Numerical Alg Algorithms Group compiler, NAG. They at least support the syntax, but don't generate parallel code yet. So first, I'll give a quick recap of some of the concepts that I talked about last time, and I can also highlight uh, what's new in terms of what's actually in the uh, GCC compiler. And then I'll talk about the two applications, one being, they're, they're both developed at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, one being the Intermediate Complexity Atmospheric Research Model, ICAR. And what we've done from that is taken a mini app that we've spun off and developed to uh, test out some of these new features. Um, and, oops. Oh yeah, and then Colray ICAR is the mini app. And then Wharf Hydro is the weather research, weather research forecasting hydrological model uh, which is also out of NCAR. And in that case, instead of developing a mini-app, we're actually working with the full application. And I'll at least be able to show you what we're doing. Uh, we don't have any results to show on, on that one just yet. So all the results will be from Cori ICAR. Is there a clock, or maybe I should just use my phone? Okay, good. <laughs> I end at 10.55, I think? No, 10. 11.15. 11.15, good. Okay, great. So uh, one slide of background to sort of motivate these new features in terms of what they do for us in helping us get to the exascale. And uh, then the feature set the, uh, and how they support single program multiple data, uh, SPMD style programming uh, using PGAS in Fortran 2018. And then also getting beyond Cori Fortran, because that entered the language in Fortran 2008, which was published in 2010. Um, and there's so much more in the language now, including some things that I think are, are especially good for embarrassingly parallel applications, uh, which uh, we don't hear as much about in the scientific computing setting, because they, in some ways, don't seem as hard. So, Moving towards the exascale and, and what Fortran is doing to respond to, uh, to the new challenges. So first of all, the, the, the challenges. We are looking at a billion-way concurrency with high levels of on-chip parallelism. 
uh, just one concept architecture is on the left there. And what Fortran is doing to support that, or one of the features you might use to, to uh, address that challenge is events. We now have an extensible class that's part of the language that uh, encapsulates uh, atomics. So you have an atomic integer that you can use to you do uh, counting semaphores. Um, and we also have a set of uh, collective subroutines, which are mostly thin wrappers around it. Let's say the, the Cori Fortran is supported by MPI, which isn't the only option, but it's the one that I'll talk about mostly here. Uh, you could think of it as a thin wrapper around MPI reduce. Um, and I'll also show the importance of having those in the language. Those are, uh, these are all features that are coming in in 2018 that weren't there in, in 2008. And a richer set of atomic subroutines. There were a couple of atomic subroutines in Fortran 2008, but uh, the feature set then was so small that it really wasn't safely usable. In fact, if you look at what I think most people would say is the most uh, commonly cited uh, for modern Fortran book, which is Modern Fortran Explained by Metcalf, Reed, and Cohen, they actually take the atomic subroutine features and push them off into a deprecated features appendix, um, partly because it, it just wasn't a large enough feature set to really be usable at that point. So now we have a much richer set of atomic subroutines. That's the only thing that I won't talk about in any detail in this talk. Uh, and then teams, which are basically groupings of processes uh, that can coordinate with each other, but independently of the other groups of, of, of processes. Moving towards the exascale, we're expecting higher failure rates. So we need ways for, uh, we need to develop fault tolerant algorithms. And uh, Fortran is, at least as I'm aware, the only mainstream language that is directly addressing that. So that uh, what we, what you might refer to as a rank in MPI, we would call an image in Fortran. So it's one instance of your program that's executing. And um, we have the ability in the language now to detect failed images. So a node has gone down, I can, uh, figure out you know, what's the set of images that, uh, that are no longer executing. And the language doesn't do a lot for me beyond that. It's still up to me to decide what to do about that failure. Uh, but at least I have the ability to continue executing in, in the face of, of failure. Um, we're expecting that data movement will become very expensive. And so that's where it's important that PGAS uses a one-sided communication approach. And um, we'll see a little bit of that in, in, in the slides. Uh, so the idea is that I can then, I can, one image can put or get data to or from another image without the other image being involved. And that, of course, can take special advantage of hardware, like RDMA hardware on InfiniBand, for example. Um, teams could also be used for uh, locality control. So when I talked about groupings of, 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 of images, I think that was originally inspired by the communities that want to do complex multi-physics models like the weather and climate community um, where you might have a team that's executing your land model, another team that's executing your ocean model, atmosphere model, you know, land, land ice, sea ice. Um, and, but what's happened is that over time, the utility of, of the team's feature has, be, has, has grown uh, and, and expanded beyond that, that basic concept to where now it plays an important role in, um, you know, in failed images, so that if I, if I have a set of images that have failed, I'd like to be able to cordon off those failed images into a separate team so that I can then continue to synchronize and call collectives and what have you within my active team of images. Um, it also could play a role in uh, data, data locality, um, where maybe I have one team that's taking advantage of offloading to an accelerator, another team that's uh, working on, on, the, on the CPU, um, and we'll have the challenge at the X scale of, of heterogeneous uh, hardware, uh, even on the processor. And this is, a, this is where the events feature might become very useful, where I might want to have an event associated with something completing uh, on the accelerator, for example. So just a quick overview of what the language uh, features look like, a uh, quick kind of review of SPMD style programming. The idea is that a, com a standard compliant Fortran compiler must be able to start up multiple instances of your program, each instance being called an image. But the standard is very careful not to specify what that image is, or in other words, uh, how it's supported under the hood. So one compiler team might support images with processes. One compiler team might support images with threads. Um, and I've seen both. Um, and, or there could be some mixture of the two. 
So each of the images then executes asynchronously, so they might be at different points in the program at, different, uh, at, at the same instant in time, up until some synchronization mechanism is encountered. And for example, the most simple or common mechanism would be a sync all, which you could think of as like an MPI barrier. Basically, we're all gonna wait here until we all get here. And other ways to synchronize, if you wanna reduce some of the global coordination and, and maybe you're doing things like a halo exchange and you wanna just synchronize with your nearest neighbors, then you can just synchronize with a set of images. And also the uh, basic communication mechanism that the programmer is given is uh, this co-array uh, data structure that I'll describe in more detail in just a moment. And if you ever allocate or deallocate memory associated with a co-array, then of course you'd want to synchronize at that point as well. And so that's one implicit synchronization that occurs because it doesn't do much good for me to be able to go out and get data from another image if I don't know that that data is there. So um, we always uh, synchronize at, a, at the allocation or deallocation of a co-array. So other allocations don't involve any synchronization. So just a quick program to kind of you know, show what this looks like. Um, and what I'm doing here is creating a derived type. You could think of it as a class. These are extensible like in uh, other object-oriented languages. Um, as you probably know, Fortran 2003 brought in object-oriented programming features. And then I'm creating a co-array of this derived type it's where the dimensions uh, in parentheses are basically uh, giving me the ability to index through local data and then what's called the co-dimension in square brackets is what gives me the ability to access remote data on other images. And so then I'm gonna do an allocation. So of course this will be a synchronization point and I'm just calling the default constructor for this, this derived type, it's, it's an empty type. And then checking the uh, local bounds on the array in the first dimension and the global bounds uh, so I can determine if I have enough data for what I wanna do because what I'm doing here will ultimately involve uh, at least three images which I can see from the, the square bracket syntax. And then what I'll do is I'll have every image except the last one go and grab two elements from their right neighbor and copy it into two of their local elements. And then if I'm image one, I'm going to copy data from image three over to image two. And specifically, I'm gonna copy the fifth element uh, from image three to image two. And I've created a couple of aliases here that tell me which image I am and how many images there are. So a couple of things to emphasize about this syntax that I really like. Uh, one is that it uh, integrates nicely with the existing language, language features from Fortran 90 where you could use things like this colon syntax that tells me I wanna have a range of uh, indices uh, for this array um, and I can it also integrates with the object-oriented features to some extent uh, because I can do things like define a derived type, which is what Fortran calls a class, and I can communicate whole objects uh, very simply. And one of the things that's really important, uh, I'd say maybe two of the main reasons that Fortran is still going are performance and backwards compatibility. And so what's really nice about the way this uh, feature was brought into the language, I should say that I'm, I'm on the Fortran committee now, uh, but I wasn't when they designed these features. So when I say that the committee did a great job, I'm not necessarily trying to praise myself. They were doing all this before I got there. <laughs> but I really think they made a lot of great decisions. And one around backwards compatibility is that I can drop the square braces if I don't need them. So on the left-hand side here, I'm only referring to local data. What that means then is if I'm trying to take a legacy code and evolve it to use the Corey Fortran features, I only have to use square bra brackets specifically where I want to communicate. If there's data that doesn't need to be communicated, I won't use square brackets. Um, if I want to communicate data, then I'll go and change that, the declaration for that uh, entity to insert the square brackets to give me that ability to communicate. But then even after I change the declaration, I can later drop the square brackets wherever I don't need them. And importantly, uh, if I'm gonna pass the data into a procedure, a subroutine or, or, or a function, and let's say that function was written in such a way that it doesn't need to communicate, it's only operating on local data, it doesn't even have to know that it's receiving something that's part of this global data structure. And that procedure doesn't change at all. Also, since communication is the bottleneck these days for most applications, 
uh, it's very important to just have a, a visual cue as soon as, simply by looking at the code to know where communication is happening or, or could happen. And I know that by observing where I see square braces and, and you know, where I don't. So this is just an illustration of what uh, one of the lines is doing when it executes. So each image is uh, grabbing two elements, elements two and three from, I guess actually I might have got the uh, root of my arrows off a little bit there, but it's supposed to be grabbing elements two, uh, two and three and, at, and copying them over to one and two. Uh, oh, I know, that's, I think I forgot to change the line because I had a race condition in it before. So it should be copying elements three and four into one and two to avoid having a race condition. So this should be three to four. So I guess the graph is right, but the code is not. And then just to show a more complicated three-way three inter interaction, one of the lines, as I mentioned, is copying uh, data from image three to image two, and, it, and specifically it's copying uh, element five of the array. But the image that's actually doing the copying is image one. So we can have uh, three-way uh, remote uh, communication happening. Now we also need some way to uh, order segments of execution, order segments of, of, of the code. And the simplest mechanism that, I'm, as I mentioned already, is synchronization, sync all, sync images, or allocation or deallocation of a co-array. Uh, but that was in Fortran 2008. Now in 2018, we have the ability to also create events, which, as I mentioned, is a derived type, or in other words, class, that encapsulates an atomic integer. And um, one image increments the event count uh, by uh, executing an, an event post statement. And a remote image can query that count uh, using an event query statement. And it's important to know which statements are image control statements. In other words, which statements are, are imposing some ordering on the segments of the code across different images because uh, anytime you impose ordering, you're going to take a performance hit. And so event post is an image control statement, so it can be used to order segments uh, of the code across images. Event, event weight is, but event query is not. So we can query in a, a very lightweight, low cost uh, manner, uh, but of course we incur some more costs when we post our weight. And so the effect of a post is to uh, do an, it's, it's like calling the atomic add, which is part of the language as well, uh, to increment and event weight decrements the count. And event query just gives you the count, basically. It defines a, a count argument that comes back from, from the call. So let's say, for example, I'm going to write a hello world example. I'll walk you through how, uh, what that would look like with events. And maybe I'm going to have image one grab greetings from every other image and print all of the greetings out. So then I'll want to have a, a co-array um, that is of event type. This is part of the language. And um, that the images can use to signal image one that their greeting is ready for pickup. And then let's say I'm going to loop and do this multiple times where every image will create a greeting on each pass through this loop. And so they'll, once they get to the second pass, they'll want to overwrite the greeting that they created in the first pass. And so I'll have an event that gives image one the ability to uh, signal to the other images it's okay to overwrite the value because I've already gotten it. So let's say image one is executing and uh, it can print out its own greeting without needing an event to coordinate that. And so let's say, so this greeting ready co-array will go from image two out to the number of images. And then uh, let's say image three uh, has some data that Im image one wants, it has the greeting to grab. So they're both executing asynchronously. And at some point, let's say image one has already printed its greeting. And now it's going to query that particular element of the event uh, co-array to for image two to see if that greeting is ready. But if it's not ready, it's not going to wait. It'll move on. And then let's say image three at some point has created its greeting, so it's going to post to its element of the greeting ready uh, event co-array to let image one know that the greeting is ready. But it won't wait. It'll move on. At some point, it's ready to overwrite that greeting. And so now it's going to have to wait on an event that image one will post after it discovers that the greeting is ready and prints it out and then posts back to image two to say, okay, it's okay to overwrite your data. Um, some constraints that the language places on, 
on events. Query and wait have to be local, so for, for performance reasons. Uh, but post, uh, and, and also uh, post and wait, because they're image control statements, uh, they're disallowed in, in the Fortran 2008 do concurrent construct. So do concurrent is a way of telling a compiler that I've got this looping uh, construct here, I've got this iteration that I want to do, and every iteration is independent of every other one. There are no data dependencies between them. So uh, because there's ordering involved there, uh, and that's something that will be difficult to do in the context of uh, exploiting concurrency through, say, vectorization, uh, we're not allowed to do posts or weights inside do concurrent. Um, and the goal here, then, is to try to overlap communication with computation. The idea is that um, I only wait when I really have to, and in the interim, I try to get as much work done as possible. So Teams is a pretty simple concept. As I mentioned, it's groupings of images, and so there's a, uh, once the, once you, everybody starts off in some initial team, and then you can partition the teams up using statements that I'll show you in a moment. And um, within a team, then if I uh, want to synchronize, I, I have now a sync team statement that I can use to just synchronize within my team. Uh, and if I am uh, doing things like a global, uh, or excuse me, uh, collective subroutines that I mentioned earlier, then those collective subroutines will only, ha only happen within the team, so I can reduce coordination across different sets of images. And once I've split the images up into teams, it, it's processor dependent what the image numbers uh, map to, but they could actually just end up being the same as they were uh, before, before the splitting. So the last thing I'll mention that's coming into the language with uh, Fortran 2018 is uh, collective subroutines. So I've, I've talked about how these mostly end up being uh, wrappers around, uh, thin wrappers around MPI procedures if, you're, if the compiler is using MPI to support uh, co arrays. So uh, I use that as a reference point since most people in this community are familiar with MPI. Um, and the idea of collective subroutines is that uh, each non-failed image of the current team must invoke the collective, it's collective, so everybody has to participate. And uh, parallel communication and, and calculation uh, result based on however the compiler or runtime library team has decided to implement this. And there are optional arguments like a stat argument that I can use to figure out how, did this actually work out or possibly did an image fail during the process of, of calling this collective. And um, I can gather the result either onto one result image or all the images can get the result. And importantly, there's no implicit synchronization uh, at the beginning or end of a collective subroutine defined in the standard. So it's up to the uh, compiler and runtime library team that are implementing this to, def to decide what's the amount of synchronization that's required to do the computation correctly and efficiently. Um, but what the standard does say is that no images data will be accessed before that image invokes the collective subroutine. So let's say you compute something, uh, compute a variable, and you're gonna pass that variable into a collective, let's say like cosum to do a sum over all the values on all the different images. Um, you, there's no need for you to call a synchronization mechanism before entering that collective, and there's nothing in the standard that guarantees that there will be a synchronization once you're in the collective, but nobody, uh, nobody's data in the, in, uh, can be used before they've invoked the collective. So we all, in, in, the, in that case, we, we all know that uh, we'll, we'll get the right result. So these are the, the collective subroutines that are in the uh, language now. We have a co-broadcast, think of it like MPI, bcast, co-max, co-min, co-sum. I imagine these are probably uh, intuitively apparent of what they do. And then co-reduce allows you to define your own operation uh, using, a for, using a pure function. Fortran 95 brought the pure keyword into the language, which is, gives you the ability to communicate to the compiler that this procedure I'm writing has no side effects. It simply maps from inputs to outputs using nothing but uh, local data. In most cases, there is one way to get around that and use some, some global data, but you don't have side effects like I.O. or segment ordering statements that I mentioned earlier. Um, you couldn't have a stop statement, although you could have an error stop statement. You can, term, you can do a global termination, uh, because basically at that point, in terms of any optimization, all, all bets are off. So uh, the, you, you can at least 
have a, an error termination in, inside a, uh, a pure procedure. But this, this allows you to, to write your own reductions, basically. Okay. And just a little bit about the importance of having these in the language. Um, and again, I imagine a lot of people are probably familiar with the MPI uh, collectives. And you know, Fortran 2008 brought the basic communication mechanism into the language of the co-array that we talked about, but didn't have these collectives. And so a Fortran 2008 programmer might be tempted to write their own collectives. And I was pretty surprised and impressed when I discovered just how bad an idea that would be. <laughs> um, what I'm doing here is comparing a few handwritten collectives, uh, the, the execution time, to the collectives that are part of the language. And um, these handwritten collectives are the kinds of collectives that a reasonably sophisticated application developer might write, you know, using things like a binary tree or recursive doubling or an alpha tree, which is a, a one parameter family of uh, uh, collective uh, algorithms or collective communication and computation algorithms. And um, in all cases that we tried, you know, you're off by a factor of two to five just running on a, on a Xeon uh, at NERSC. And when you get over to KNL, it gets significantly worse. I mean, we're looking at orders of magnitude difference in performance uh, ver using the collectors that are part of the language versus writing your own. So I think this addition in Fortran 2018 is a really important step for the language. Um, failure detection, uh, let's see, of the things that we that talked about last year that were sort of previews, I think the two were Teams and uh, failed, images, failed image detection. Um, teams uh, was at least partial support. I should emphasize partial. We have, it's not all uh, complete yet, but at least in the GCC 7 release last year, you had support for Teams. And in the upcoming GCC 8 release, uh, I'm sorry, you had support for um, failed images, and in the upcoming GCC8 release, uh, you'll also have support for teams. So uh, the failed image detection, but actually probably when we gave this talk a year ago, neither of those I think was, was in the language. So the idea here is that an image goes down, or an image stops executing because, or maybe you can't reach it because of a network failure or a node has gone down. And so what we have now in the language is a, a, a value that's defined in a standard module and if we call a sync statement, we can check the status uh, that comes out of that statement. And if that status is failed image, then, well, we have to decide what to do. We'll call some you know, fault tolerant algorithm that handles that situation. So it's, it's minimal, but I think it's, it's important. It's an important step. I mean, you, know, you still have to do the heavy lifting of designing the fault tolerant algorithm yourself. Um, there's a statement that you can use to simulate failures, which, will be, which is, of course, important for testing your fault-tolerant algorithm. Um, you can check the status of a specific image. You can uh, get a list of the uh, failed images. And it's allowed for core operations to fail. If we go back to the simple communication I had in those lines where I showed the graphics for the movement of the data, you can actually add a comma stat equals inside the square brackets so that not just the uh, language provided in, intrinsic procedures like the collective subroutines, but also your own communication that you're designing with your core array data structure uh, can be fault tolerant. You can check to see if that communication went through. It's not necessarily the prettiest notation, notation but we could, I don't know that we could think of anything better and at least, you can, at least it gets the job done. Okay, um, talking about some results. Ooh, should wrap up quickly. Um, so I mentioned the ICAR model, and uh, the idea here is that the, the two people that I'm working with at, at NCAR are hydrologists, and the problem they face is that the, none of the atmospheric models produce data at the resolution that they need. Um, there are models that uh, could give them what they want, but it would be way too expensive. And so they decided to write their own atmospheric model just for producing uh, precipitation information for, the, for their hydrology model. And uh, it's, it's called ICAR. Um, it uh, advex uh, variables uh, across a, a terrain. So you can have topology like um, a hill. And by using uh, some analytical, analytical solutions uh, to help reduce the cost, they can get about 90% of the information for 1% of the computational cost. So this is uh, just 
an idea, an example of uh, the kind of uh, resolution that you get out of the actual ICAR model. Uh, we don't have any visual visualizations yet out of the co-array ICAR model, but we're showing here water vapor uh, in, in blue, precipitation in the green to red colors. And really important factor is that the, the scientists who I was working with on developing the mini app that we spun off from this um, previously had no parallel programming experience beyond OpenMP and shared memory. And so the current ICAR model, which is open source and available online, only runs in a single node. Um, you can see that it gives you uh, results uh, with a level of fidelity that's pretty close to what the, uh, what the full uh, ICAR model can give you. And you know, this is an important application. It's used worldwide. These are all the different uh, users across the globe. And so getting this into distributed memory and scaling it up is, is an important task for them. Um, it's an object -oriented, the code uses object-oriented design uh, and uh, uses collectives, and, uh, at least for the initialization of the data, um, uses one-sided communication to overlap communication and computation. Um, it's about 2,000 lines of new code and about 5,000 lines of a pre-existing code that does all the cloud microphysics calculations. The Wharf Hydro model, model um, it currently runs, uh, when they want to do ensemble runs, they actually they have to do a, a redundant calculations across every member of the ensemble that take up about 30% of the runtime. And so the goal that, our goal with, uh, with the Wharf Hydro module, model was to um, reduce that redundancy and at the beginning of a simulation be able to amortize that initialization across all of the processes that you have available rather than repeating the calculation in each uh, individual member of the ensemble. I think I'll skip through here. This is just kind of talking about uh, some of the basic idea of, of teams and how that compares to MPI colors. And I think without going into a tremendous amount of detail here, we only added one minor um, extension to the language, which was this little get communicator function because we, what we wanted to do is run an existing MPI code but have Coray Fortran in the driver's seat, and at least in the case that we were using, uh, that we were supporting the Coray Fortran with MPI, we would expose the communicator so that uh, the existing application only had to have trivial modifications. So basically, you get rid of the MPI init and uh, MPI finalize and let uh, Coray Fortran do that. Okay, let's quickly look at some results. I only have a minute or two left, or not. <laughs> Um, the number one thing I want to point out here is that, as I keep mentioning, MPI is not the only way to support Coray Fortran, and this turned out to be critical for us because they were running on an SGI platform where the one-sided communication that's built into SGI's MPI library called MPT stopped working after a couple thousand cores. And so fortunately, we were able to take the exact same Coray Fortran source code, did not change a single line of the code. In fact, I don't think we even had to recompile uh, the source code. We could just take the object files and link them to an open Schmem layer that supports uh, Coray Fortran that's part of uh, the open Coarays library that I uh, lead the development of. And then we could just keep going and get essentially the same performance. Um, some results showing that we get a higher a fraction of the ideal speed up on, on K and L, uh, but uh, longer execution times. And the single most important thing I think about this is that this code was developed in a series of uh, pair programming sessions done over screen share between me and the researcher at NCAR. One or two hours a week uh, over a span of, I don't know, a few months, three to six months. Most of that time was actually on the object-oriented design. The actual parallelization was really quick. We estimate that it was about a total of 100 people hours. And that's what it took to take a programmer who had not done any parallel programming beyond OpenMP and shared memory to running on 98,000 cores with high parallel efficiency. That's what you get from having a model that's built into the language and built into it in a way that seamlessly integrates with the older features in the language. Okay, so to wrap up, um, Fortran 2018 is a PGAS language now that supports SPMD parallel programming. Um, it's really important that the programming model that's in the language is, is, or let's say that the parallel features in the language are programming model agnostic, 
We can support them with MPI, OpenShmim. We've also tried GasNet, um, ARMC. And high productivity really pays off. Um, I mentioned this already. And also, we're able to interoperate uh, with MPI. So looks like I went two minutes over, I think. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, should we skip questions and move on then? OK, well, any questions? Yes? When you detect failure, is it possible to recover from it and do collective communications on the nodes except those that fail? Yeah, so um, you know, it, it depends on your algorithm. So one idea is you know, we're not going to try and do a, a global checkpoint because that's too expensive, but maybe each image has a pair and you know, they store, a, they checkpoint each other's data. And so hopefully we don't both go down and I can restart using my pair image or using my pair images data and I can take that, that set of failed images, cordon them off to a failed image team, and then I can just keep going with my active teams. So yeah, the, the idea is that you should be able to keep executing in the presence of failure. So you wouldn't have to restart the whole application, you should just restart failure. Exactly, yeah. Or maybe not restart, maybe replace. So you probably have a team that's at the beginning of the simulation is your reserve team. And these images are doing nothing until they're needed, right? And then you pull one of those and then take the failed stuff and put them off somewhere else. How does the hardware detect that the image failed? Is it like an uncorrectable memory error? Or? Yeah, I don't think the standard says anything about that. So it's, you know, it's, obviously it's going to depend a lot on what the underlying communication library is. So MPI has some failed, has some fault tolerant features that are, I believe will be in the next MPI uh, standard, MPI 4. But some MPI implementations, like for example, mPitch, are already supporting those features. And so what we're doing is, I guess, kind of taking a bet and, and building on top of those, those features. So how that's done is decided by MPI, basically. Um, I don't know any details about you know, how long they wait or what, what's determining uh, you know, what's, uh, how something failed or when something failed. So I should also say that uh, when I mentioned this stuff is coming out in GCC8, currently uh, you have to also install a separate parallel runtime library, which is Open Core Arrays, which is developed uh, by Sorcery Institute. And um, you need those two things. We're actually working on, I have a, a student uh, who's coming to work with me for 12 weeks this spring, and his project is going to be integrating the installation of Open Core Arrays into the G Fortran build, uh, build scripts so that automatically every time you install G Fortran, uh, which is the Fortran front end for GCC, you'll automatically get open core arrays, which then gives you all these features. Uh, 